Hello, and thank you for joining us online. I'm Dante Dowdy, the executive pastor here at Father's House Church, where we build communities to fully experience and express the love of God. Join us today for the next portion of our Aftermath series and a time of worship with Joy Coates, our Children's Church pastor. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm Joy Coates, the children's pastor here at Father's House Church, and I'm really happy to be able to be bringing you this teaching this morning. Before we get started, um, I'd like to just pray. Let's, let's pray that God's Spirit would really be here in a powerful way this morning, and that as we sit under God's Word, this, this is God's Word that we're about to hear, that we're about to read. Um, it's not just me here talking and having a one-sided conversation with you. It's God speaking through his word. That's what we believe as Christians. So as we do that, let's just pray that God would give us humble hearts and attentive ears to hear and respond to what he might say to us today. So would you pray with me? Father, we come to you in your name. We just thank you so much for just this ability to... uh, to meet in this kind of way. We thank you, Father, that even in spite of everything that's happening in this world today, that we can remember that you, Lord, are in charge, that you are reigning over all of this, God. And so what better news than that, to know that. And so we thank you, Jesus, that your spirit will be here, that your words will be what's heard this morning, and that hearts and lives will be altered and changed for your glory, God. So we just welcome you in this place. We love you. May you be honored this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are continuing our series called Aftermath, um, post-resurrection encounters that Jesus had with others. And we're going to be looking in the book of Acts in just a minute, but I want to intro this by sharing just a brief story with you. Last week, as I was studying and preparing for this sermon, um, I don't know about you and how you study the Bible, but one of the things that I like to do first is just to kind of go back and and try to recall anything that I think I already know about the subject matter that that I've been asked to speak about, or if I've ever had written anything down, any kind of sermon notes or anything like that. So I just want to go, you know, think about those things as a starting point. So knowing that the person that um, we'd be looking at and studying at this morning is Stephen, he's known as a martyr in the book of Acts. The only thing that I could quickly recall about him or the subject of martyrs was a book I once owned in my teen years called Jesus Freaks, Martyrs, Stories of Those Who Stood for Jesus, The Ultimate Jesus Freaks. Do you guys remember that one? Yeah, it was um, by DC Talk. (laughs) I probably purchased it at Acquire the Fire or something like that. And during this quarantine, I've done a lot of major spring cleaning. I don't know if you have too, but I've come across so many old journals. And as I was remembering the book I just mentioned, I wondered if I could find a journal that maybe I wrote in um, that may have accompanied me by in my reading of this book. Um, I didn't find necessarily that, but I did discover a lot of weird things. <laughs> and I'm not sure if the two of them correlated, but I found this journal and I found this question um, that I responded to, and it actually has helped me on this topic. This question, um, I want to read it to you. It asked a very interesting thing. It says, how do you respond to the possibility of dying because you are a follower of Jesus? I don't know if you're like me, but when I look at old journals or something I've written, I'm always nervous. I'm sort of embarrassed even. Um, it's one of the reasons why I don't keep journals anymore, because I know when I die, someone's going to read them. And, but I was looking at this, and I was like, what did I say back then? How did I respond to it? And I was actually kind of amazed at how awesome what I said was and how right on it was. So this is actually what I wrote down. I said, honestly, I don't really think about dying or being martyred because I'm a follower of Jesus that often at all. And when I do, it's so 
theoretical, so hypothetical, I don't feel like I can actually answer the question with honesty. I think most of us here in the United States who are followers of Jesus would have to say in our more honest moments, unless we feel at some level called to go to dangerous places for world missions, that that's the case for us. Even though thousands upon thousands of Christians are martyred worldwide every year for their faith, even though an estimated uh, 2.3 billion Christians, our brothers and sisters who Peter and others in the Bible would say, we need to remember and pray for as, as we're there with them, as if we're there with them, being persecuted with them, in the jail, in those horrible situations. I just don't believe we can really imagine what it's like to die for our faith. I certainly think it's helpful for us to pause and ponder that possibility, but I don't think in our hearts and our minds, we'd find, I think we'd find it impossible to actually answer that question, are you willing to die for Jesus? So it might actually be more helpful then to ask this. Are we willing to live for Jesus? So just take a step back. We can talk about if you want to die for Jesus and be theoretical, but are you even willing to live for Jesus? Maybe even a step before that, we could ask this uh, more basic question. What are we living for, really? And this is where I'd like us just to focus for a bit. If we're going to go to coffee someday, if we ever get to do that again, and I get to sit down and ask you, what's the story you're living for? What's the vision that's driving and compelling your life? What would you say? You see, every one of us, Christian or non-Christian, young or old, educated or uneducated, black or white, is living our own life for a story for a particular vision of the good life and whatever story we're living for, whatever story we're living out, it shapes our lives. It shapes our pursuits. It shapes our identities. It shapes everything about us. What story are you living for? Let me give you an example of how this plays out in in pop culture. Some of you know Rihanna. Some of you don't. Maybe you should. She's a cultural icon, a big figure in the R&B and pop world. Um, And in 2009, Rihanna's boyfriend, Chris Brown, almost beat her to death before the Grammy Awards. Uh, He had rented a Lamborghini. They got in an argument. He beat her up. He kicked her out of the car. He left her on the side of the road to die. And then he just went on. Eventually, they found him, and they charged him with a felony. A couple of years after this, Rolling Stone did this incredible piece on her and her life, and it talked about her life story. One of the things it said, um, even from her mom's point of view, was that the big defining characteristic for Rihanna was she was she's always been strong and a very independent woman, always. Of course, you see this even after the incident, playing itself out with her response. These are her her own words. After the incident, she said, I put my guard up so hard. I didn't want people to see me cry. I didn't want people to feel bad for me. It was a very vulnerable time in my life, and I refused to let that be the image. Her story is she's so strong and independent. So even in a crushing moment like this, to be weak, to put down her guard, she couldn't do that. She says, I wanted people to see me as I'm fine, I'm tough. I put up, I put that up until it felt real. Here you're seeing, this is my story, this is my identity, and now this is how it's going to shape my behavior. This is how it's going to shape my response to crisis. This article says it even began to shape the music that she put out, uh, the clothes that she wore, even the smirk on her face. She says, I put that up 
until it felt real. Story, uh, a vision of who you are, vision of your life, it drives and shapes us. And it doesn't just shape individuals. It, it actually shapes organizations and institutions. Of course, those of you who are in uh, marketing and advertising, you know this full well. Even, even entire nations have stories they're living for. You may have actually heard of ours. The American story, the American dream, your entitlement to life, liberty, and above all, the pursuit of a personal happiness, regardless of the cost. We are now, as a country, hopefully examining this story, hopefully re rewriting this story so that it's not just it's not just a white man's story. Every individual, every organization, every culture is living their life in light of a story, their, their particular vision of what matters most in this life. Whatever your story you and I are living for, whatever vision of the good life that drives us, that has so captured our hearts, it compels us and shapes us, in every way, it controls us. As an evangelist and and author Rebecca Piper, I think is how you say her name, she once wrote in one of her books a long time ago this very interesting statement. She says, whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by acceptance. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. That is a very sobering statement. Whatever Lord controls our lives is who or what you and I are not only living for, but also that which we may be willing to die for. Again, I mean, you hear this in culture all the time. Uh, Pastor John and I, we were recently watching the Lance Armstrong documentary just entitled Lance, I think. Um, I know there's been several and because John watched it ahead of me, um, I was one night searching for the ESPN one, and I came across others, and I came across one that was entitled um, The Armstrong Lie, and I just watched the trailer. And this was the opening line. This is quoting Lance Armstrong. If you don't know who he is, he's a cyclist. He was a really good one, and we found out he cheated, and so he's not that good anymore. But anyway, this is what he said in this trailer. He says, I like to win. But more than anything, I can't stand the idea of losing because to me, that equals death. Y'all, that's lordship language. You tie death to anything, that's lordship language. It's not just athletes. Jimmy Fallon, the Tonight Show host, he said in an interview a number of years ago, he says, I remember saying to myself, if I don't make it on Saturday Night Live before I'm 25, I'm going to kill myself. That's a controlling, shaping vision, story, desire. He said, it's crazy. I had no other plan. I didn't have friends. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have anything going on. I had my career, and that was it. What well, Fallon and, and Armstrong and any other person we'd want to pick out from these articles in culture, they're just, they're, all they're doing is simply making, making a, a soul confession that I think all of us live with. We have a story. We have a vision. The hard part now is to quit looking at all these celebrities and, and to look at our hearts. Look at our hearts. So how then can we really know what or who is controlling us? How can we really be self-aware enough and, and take an honest look at the story or the Lord of our lives and discover honestly who that or, or what that really is. I came across some interesting questions that I think that we should ask ourselves to help our hearts to take um, this journey. And I just want to briefly read some of these questions to you. And I'd encourage you to, to, you don't have to write them down, but maybe you can go back later and find this part um, in this recording and, and just, just think about these things um to help you find out what is the story i'm living out what who's the lord that's controlling my story so here's the first question early on in your conversations with people and your relationships 
What do you want to make sure people know about you? That's a great question. In those first five minutes, that thing that you're just itching to let them know about yourself, you just have to put it out there because it's so central to your identity. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, even good things. Like, what's the thing you want people to know about you right up front that you just have to lead out with that, with that foot? What preoccupies you? What do you daydream about? When you're alone, where does your mind go? What makes you feel the most self-worth? What are you the most proud of in your life? For what do you want to be known? And what if, if you failed or you lost it all, like, like Lance Armstrong or Jimmy Fallon demonstrated, what if you lost it all? Would you feel like you wouldn't even want to live anymore? What do you worry about the most? What do you, what gets you balled up with anxiety? Where do you look for, what do you look for for comfort when those things do go badly and things do get difficult? Lastly, you know, what goal or desire unreached would seriously make you think about turning away from God. What we're going to see now in Acts 6 and 7 today, through the life and the example of Stephen, is a beautiful and forceful witness of the one story and the one Lord who is ultimately worth living and, if need be, dying for. We have a front row seat to God's vision of the good life, to the story of of the Lord who is better than any other, who's even better than life itself. So if you're in Acts 6, uh, let's start reading in verse 7. I want to pick it up here because it's uh, it's a good summary sentence. Um, this is after Pentecost. It's after Ananias and Sapphira incident. It's Let's start in Acts 6. Uh, let's do verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. That's a really great thing, gospel-centered multiplication. Verse 8 says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of these of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So this picture we get of Stephen, we know from, from earlier in the chapter that he's, he's a good, he has a good reputation, that he's full of wisdom in the, and in the spirit. Um, but here in verses 8 through 10, we see he's doing great signs and wonders, that he's such a powerful proclaimer and witness of Jesus, and they don't know what to do with him. His ministry was so powerful that his critics became so frustrated, and and they went behind the scenes, and in verse 11, we'll see, they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him. Listen to this mob scene. They grabbed Stephen because they're mad because they don't know how to talk to him in a way that makes them look better than him. So they seize him and bring him before the council, and they set up false witnesses. Verse 13 says, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. That's a weird little verse that sort of brings to mind uh, Moses after he met with God or, or even Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But, but still, they stirred up false witness and they bring up accusations um, that he was blaspheming God. The high priest, he, he hears this, and again, this is, this, this is the Supreme Court. This isn't like the district judge. This is the Supreme Court of the nation he's standing before. And the high priest says, are these things so? Uh, I know there's a lot of 
great courtroom drama movies based on real events, and I love them. But what, what you have here in Acts chapter 7 is one of the best courtroom scenes in, in the history of the world. I mean, they, they drag this guy full of power and wisdom and accuse him of something that's false. Sounds like a major abuse of power, right? And his response is, it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. We're not actually going to read the whole thing in its entirety. It's lengthy. But I want you to do this maybe um, maybe with your, your small group or something. Read in chapter 7, verses 2 through 50. We'll see here Stephen's response, his defense. And it's, it's in the form of a sermon. He takes the accusations against him and preaches a sermon where he takes the salvation story of Israel found in our Old Testament. This is what the driving storyline of those who are accusing him is. He takes the story they're living out and he shows them that they're, they've actually got it. They've gotten their own story wrong because they've misunderstood Jesus. It's, it's brilliant what he does. He tells them, you're actually the ones who are living out the wrong story. You're actually the blasphemous ones because you, just, just like your forefathers before you, you've rejected the true Lord. That's the essence of, of his sermon. Um, like I said, we don't have time to look through it all, um, but maybe with your watch party group or your spouse, your friendship circle, you know, read this. Stephen's defense in his sermon is basically because I understand Jesus I understand your story better than you do. That's what he tells them. Because I understand that, that Moses pointed us towards Jesus. Because I understand that Jesus is the true fulfillment of the law. Because I understand that Jesus and now us as his people are the true temple of God where heaven and earth meet. I'm the one who's actually living in accordance with the story of, of Israel and her God. And, and you're not. You know, bam, you know, put that in a movie. It's, it's unbelievable. Don't miss a drama of the moment because for us, because what, what Stephen is telling these religious leaders is something that's still very relevant and confrontational for you and me right now. He's saying the story we're living for, whatever it is, is incomplete and therefore misshaped and the wrong story without Jesus as the center of it. That was true for them and it's true for our story as well. So, so hear me. If the story you are living for, whether it's religious or irreligious, and that's, that's the sobering thing to, to know because they were living for something extremely religious. Um, if it does not have Jesus at the center and Lord of it, it is misshaped and a wrong story. And it's not the story to live for. It's not the Lord to live for. One, one of the responsibilities that we have as a community of faith, and I'm speaking directly to those of you who are Christians, especially us who are part of this, part of this church as members, um, we have a responsibility to encourage one another to keep Jesus as the Lord and center of our stories. This is what we should be doing all the time in our relationships. This is what we should be doing all the time in our marriages and our friendships. Is Jesus the center of your story? Stay-at-home moms, how is Jesus the story of your daily routine? Students, how does Jesus transform your college experience? Empty nesters? What does Jesus have to say about your finally quiet house? For all of us who have jobs, how does Jesus connect to our vocation? How does our faith uh, and our work integrate as, as in entrepreneurs, as, as athletes, as accountants, as plumbers, as artists, as musicians? Is Jesus connected to our, to our outcries for justice? Is Jesus connected to our protests? Is, is Jesus connected to how we vote, to what we post? It should be. 
If not, our stories and our lives, no matter how religious, will be misshaped. These are conversations we should have one with one with, with another all the time, um, especially because it's, it's very easy to get to a place where we can't see where our stories, our efforts to make change, we can't see like our, that they're misshaped and where we start serving other lords. Every one of us, you included, was made to look to a story and to a Lord for meaning, for, for rescue, for love, for purpose, for freedom. This is what the Bible calls salvation. But the story you're made for is not a story with you or your own desires at the center of it. This is what Stephen would say. This is what the Bible testifies Unless Jesus Christ is the center of your story, you'll never find a happy ending. No other lords love us like Jesus. They enslave us. They burden us. They leave us empty and anxious. So through his sermon, Stephen completely flips the accusations against him on their head. And and in a not-so-subtle way, they'll get him killed. He accuses his accusers of the very thing he's standing trial for. And in verses um, 51 through 53, there's this underlining tone that he has. He's saying, you're missing it, just like your forefathers. They rebelled against God. He gave them a second chance, so come back to the Lord. You're being disobedient. Quit resisting the Spirit of God. Quit being stiff-necked. Quit being stubborn of heart. Come back. And this is Stephen being gracious. He's calling them to repentance and love. He has actually turned his accusations into a call for repentance. And this is just incredible to me. I mean, could you do that? Could you, being put in this position of false accusation, Um, Would you have the ability to be gracious enough to use that moment, that rebuttal, as a time to call your accusers lovingly to repentance? Sadly, Stephen's appeal here does not lead them to examine their hearts. It doesn't humble them to see that because they've rejected and murdered Jesus, they're living out of a misshaped story. It actually just enrages them all the more. And in verse 54, we see the response. Now, when they heard these things, they didn't repent. They didn't humble themselves. They were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I know that might seem random, but let's remember that in Jesus' own trial, he said, listen, I'm going to be at the right hand of the Father. What Stephen sees here is a validation that Jesus is who he says he is. And more than that, what he sees is a picture of Jesus next to the Father, ruling and reigning with all authority as the judge. As he's being mistreated and judged wrongly, you know who's really the judge overseeing this whole thing? Yeah, his Lord. How encouraging is this for for those of us that are walking through tough times, I mean, who are being persecuted right now, those of you who have been oppressed by this society for generations, those of you who have not seen justice in your lifetime, those of you whose whose hopes are, are being, you know, being heard are growing so weary. To be able to look up in that moment and know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. One day, somehow, some way, this Lord, this judge who died for our sin, he will make things right. He will make the crooked straight. So even as we're seeing this crooked story, Stephen, he's looking up and he sees Jesus and he knows he's reigning. That's encouraging. 
he says what he says, and you know what? You know, the people who are accusing him, they knew they were being judged in that moment. Now, how can we know this? Well, because their response to that vision is this. In, in verses 57 and 58, they say, it says, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. I know that's just one sentence, and it's a horrible sentence. They dragged him out. In these times, there were actually ways that they stoned people that were more humane, more organized, and I don't know how there's anything humane about stoning, but this is not an organized stoning. This is an enraged mob. They just pull him out of the city and they stone him. Verses 59 goes on to say, And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. At this moment, we have a turning point in the book of Acts because Stephen's murder will be a catalyst for the church multiplying and scattering out as they became you know, became persecuted more and more. I can't help but see the resemblance of, of this time and the current state of our country. It's because of Stephen and, and how the Lord used him and the persecutions that followed that the gospel went out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I'm so hopeful, and I think you should be too, that even in a tumultuous time in our nation, these moments that will be recorded in history, you know, between a, a health pandemic and an economic pandemic and this amazing human rights movement, we can have hope that the message, message of Jesus will continue to go out, that because of the brave outcries for justice, that truth will prevail. Let's just conclude now by, by thinking about Stephen's life and the death and what it teaches us. And what it teaches us is that there's only one story, the gospel. There's only one Lord who's really worth living and dying for. Is that the story you're living out of? Is Jesus your Lord? As heroic and, and inspiring as Stephen's death is, you guys, Jesus' death teaches us far more. Because unlike Stephen and, and any other hero who has died for a good cause along the way in history, man, Jesus, Jesus didn't just die to be a good example. Jesus' death was substitutionary. And he bought and purchased more than just a good example. Jesus died to save us from our sins. Jesus is the true Lord who died so we could have our lives that are live for lesser lords and lesser stories. I mean, he died so that we could be saved. He said it himself uh, once in Luke 9, 23 through 26. He said, if, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and daily, daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the world? What does it profit us if we gain whatever our misshaped story and false lords are promising us and yet forfeit our souls, our very lives? It doesn't profit us anything. Today, Jesus, he stands, he stands ready to receive us, to save us. He loves us. And he says, come, follow me. Come join the story I have purchased for you. And let me be the Lord of your life. Come see, like Stephen learned, that my steadfast love is better than even life. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for Stephen. We thank you that even 2,000 years later that we can use his life as an example to examine ourselves and ask ourselves, what are we willing to live for? Jesus, we want to live for you. We thank you that you are the Lord of our life, that even when we mess up, even when we serve other gods, even when we, we, we lose ourselves doing that, that you are right there ready for us. And that we just simply have to say, Lord, be the Lord. Be the Lord of my life. 
I'm sorry. We just thank you, Father, that you are right here ready to receive us, to forgive us, not just of our past mistakes, but even future ones, Lord. You love us that much. We are so grateful that we live in a time such as this. I thank you, Father, that you are empowering us to spread your gospel, your good news to those around us, to give hope and life to anyone who can hear it, Father. And we just thank you, Lord, for all those opportunities now. God, we thank you for this house, this body, Father's house, that you will use this place as a beacon of grace, as a, as a beacon of hope. I thank you, Father, for that right now in Jesus' name. God, we love you. We thank you that your name is honored today. We thank you that you are the center of our world, God. And we love you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
song my soul can find to sing is hallelujah, it's hallelujah, it's hallelujah, my King. It's Thank you for joining us online. I hope that in this message and time of worship, you found something that spoke to your heart. I know I did. We here at Father's House would like to thank you for your continued giving while we are online. Your generosity and faithfulness allows us to help others experience God's love. And you can continue to give online through our app or by mail. We are absolutely looking forward to meeting together in person beginning next Sunday, June 21st. We cannot wait to see you. We will continue to live stream our services for those who are unable to join us physically. But remember, we love you and see you in church or online next week.